blood-curdling scream coming from the barn. I was suddenly filled with a kind of intense dread. I just felt this hand. I have never in my life been that frightened. So many strange things started taking place. All I saw was a silhouette of a person just moving. I started hearing footsteps and ran out the house. I called said, don't come back to the house. There's a ghost in the house. The light above us explodes. I mean, it poof. I felt cold wind. It felt like somebody was there in the room with me. I freaked out. Here, let's get out of this room. It comes to me very, very easily, those feelings of absolute terror of going into that building. What I had experienced was something genuine, something evil, something malevolent, something that meant me harm. In the late 1950s, my father bought an old rundown farmhouse in mid-Maine. He was an abstract expressionist painter. He painted the landscape, and the landscape of Maine was completely what he had, had been looking for. The house had been uninhabited for well over 25 years. It was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, the closest access to any road was over a mile away. We spent our summers there, and it was a beautiful, beautiful place. There was one outbuilding, which was a barn, sort of your classic New England barn. It was quite large, and it was open in the loft, exposed up to the top with beams. My father chose the barn as his studio, and my father had his palette there and his table with all of his colors and his canvases, and there really wasn't much else in there. Maybe some firewood. My brother and I were not allowed to play in his studio, and we were not allowed to go into his studio without his presence. That was his workspace, and it needed to be treated with respect. That was my father's rule. We had some friends visiting one summer, I was about nine. And we liked to play in the dark with flashlight tag, other things like that. So we were running around having a good time. One of my friends, when he heard us coming, he fled and went around and went inside of the barn, unbeknownst to us. I remember trying to find my friend. Where are you? We hear this blood curdling scream coming from the barn. This scream was that of someone being seriously injured. That was my friend. And he came running, hysterical. It looked as if all the blood had been drained from his body. It was like he was having some sort of a seizure. Shaking, screaming, crying. He was literally white as a sheet. I remember trying to find some sort of an injury on him and trying to calm him down. My father and the other adults came out of the house after we were able to calm him down, he said he went into the barn. He was giggling all over, giggling. And he started to hear giggling. 
And then he was violently grabbed. But there was nobody in the barn with him. The boy would not stay. And they had to leave. Those people never came back. It was at that point I realized that there was something wrong with that barn. I just put into place the practice that I only went into that barn during the daytime, and I kept the door wide open. One day, my brother and I were going to go and ride our motorcycles. I was about 10 years old. At that point, my father had moved us to the house in Maine, and we were living there full time. And it was uh, pretty austere. So we were sort of packing up kind of a picnic lunch or some water and some food and things to bring. And my father went out to his studio. My father came storming into the kitchen, and he seemed to be excessively angry. What's the rule? And he said, what's the rule? What's the rule? He was shouting at my brother and I, what's the rule about the studio? You guys were in there messing around with my stuff. Of course, I said, it wasn't me. And my brother, of course, said, what, what, what do you mean? And we're going, well, what are you talking about? My father said, come out here. I want you to see this and look at this. So we went out to the barn. Come on. Tubes of paint had been squirted out, and they were stomped on with a serious kind of force. The brushes had been sort of shaken out across one of his canvases. It was an enormous nine foot by six foot blank canvas. Because it was very low to the ground, you could see the child had done this. It chilled me. And my brother looked petrified. My brother and I both swore up and down that we didn't do it. What is it? I swear we didn't do it. We were inside the house. We don't know Never come in here at night. Never come in here at night. We were instructed by my father not to go in there at night. Never come in here at night. Never. Come on. Let's go. It was never an issue of whether I would go into that barn at night, and certainly not after the incident that occurred with the boy, <laughs> and later with myself. Never come in here at night. Never. We were instructed by my father not to go in there at night. Come on, let's go. It was never an issue of <laughs> whether I would go into that barn at night, and certainly not after the incident that occurred with the boy, <laughs> and later with myself. Sometime in the wintertime. It was a particularly cold day, and we heated the house entirely with wood, which meant there were massive wood boxes, and they had to be stocked. My job was to keep them stocked at all times. And the firewood was stored in the barn. And it was a particularly cold day, and the fires, we'd just burn up more wood than usual. And I kind of said, you know, I didn't want to go out and, and, and deal with it, but now it's dark. I've got to reload, you know, some of the boxes before we go to bed. And I knew that I did not want to go into that barn at night, but I had to do it. I had two canvas carriers, and I had a flashlight that I sat on some old wooden crates so I could see what I was taking off and began to load them. And I thought I 
heard a sound, maybe the wind, because it was blowing quite hard that night. And then it kind of changed, and it went from that kind of sound of the wind to more of like a and I was suddenly filled with a kind of intense dread and the hair kind of went up on the back of my neck because I realized what I was hearing was like a whispering and what I really needed to do was to get that wood and get out of there as quickly as I could. The volume of the whispering, the intensity of the whispering became very aggressive. And I remember picking the flashlight up and kind of looking around the room really where it was most audible was the cross beam, the center cross beam. <laughs> and then it moved from that to giggling. It was not friendly. It was not the sound of joy of children playing and having a good time. It was threatening. I was petrified. And the giggling became louder and louder and louder. <laughs> All of a sudden, the sound was no longer confined to the crossbeam. I was completely enveloped in the kind of sound. It was all around me. I was completely, completely surrounded. Suddenly, I just felt this hand this upon me, something pulling me. I was terrified. I have never in my life been that frightened. And I ran. I ran for my life out of that barn. I sort of convinced myself that my brother had been doing this and this was him playing some kind of a nasty trick on me to scare me. I ran into the house, completely hysterical, crying, screaming, and I began to yell and rant about my brother and like a crazy person. My father put his arms firmly on my shoulder and he said, your brother is in the living room and has not left the living room since you left this house. I understand. I understand. At that point, my father admitted his own fear of the building. It was the first time I ever saw any kind of vulnerability in my father's face, and it frightened me. Never come in here at night. Never come in here at night. I understand. And that's when it really brought it home to me. There was no trickery involved. So what was it? What was it? My father was concerned. He began to sort of investigate around, ask questions of some of the local people. He went to the man that he had bought the house from, who was now a very, very, very elderly man. 
He told my father that the people that had owned the house prior to us, some 30 years before, it was a man and his wife, a couple of boys, and a girl. They lived a very, very austere life. It was a man who was a preacher. This man one evening had had a premonition that the world was going to come to an end. And so he drugged his wife and his children so that they were incapacitated and then took them one by one up into the loft and onto the crossbeam. And hung them. And then hung himself. The idea that a person would be so insane that they could do that was so abhorrent and so evil. That was the malevolence that emanated from that structure. Perhaps those children, their inability to be able to cross over was inhibited by their father, who was such an evil entity. The giggling was not the giggling of children released from the burden of life on Earth. And that barn really ostensibly just became sort of a warehouse for unused things, broken machinery, but it was never used again as a studio. It was never used again as a place to play. It remains there today. In fact, our house burnt to the ground entirely, leaving nothing left but the barn. I didn't believe that there was a such thing as ghosts until I actually had my encounter, which was just an experience that I don't think I'll ever forget. When I was about 16, my friend Ralph invited me to come out to LA. And I met this lady who owned the house that he was staying in. Her name was Alicia, and she had two houses, and she lived most of the time in Las Vegas. I remember telling her how much I love LA, and she offered me an opportunity to live at the house because she had extra room. So I took her up on the offer. A few days later, Alicia decided to go back to Las Vegas. Later that night, I go to bed. And my room was on the left wing of the house, and Ralph's room was on the right wing of the house. I started hearing footsteps. This had to have been like maybe about four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning. And I'm assuming, you know, Ralph must have just came on the other side to use the bathroom on my side. So I didn't think nothing of it. Went back to sleep. woke up and I asked him, you know, why did you come all the way over my side to, to use the bathroom? And he says, well, I didn't come over on your side of the house. So I'm thinking he's just joking. The next day, I 
I hear these footsteps again. I jumped up and I said, okay, I'm gonna catch him. So I opened the door and I looked. There was nothing there, nobody. I didn't fall back to sleep right away. The next day, I was talking to Ralph and I said, you know, um, I'm hearing footsteps. Again, I thought it was you. And he said, I told you, I don't, I don't come over that side. I'm like, okay, maybe I was just tripping. So Ralph and I decided to set up a, a studio in the house. And so many strange things started taking place. One night, we was recording. And after I finished up recording the vocals, We played the song back. And there was this sound. It was this crazy, weird, echoey sound. And we both looked at each other. And then we played it back again. It disappears. I stopped, I looked at Ralph, and he looked at me, and we both kind of snuck our shoulders at each other like, that was strange. A few days later, we was working so late, I fell asleep in the studio. And I hear footsteps. And the footsteps were light at first. And then they got heavier, and I still didn't see anybody. And I jumped up, and I opened up the door. And the footsteps were still going, and they got heavier and heavier. And I almost <laughs> defecated on myself. I ran over to Ralph's room and knocked on Ralph's door. Ralph! I said, yo, there's somebody in here. I said, I, I didn't see anybody, but just footsteps going back and forth, back and forth. He goes, maybe you're just hearing things. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm starting to really have concerns, but I'm trying not to show fear. And both of us are still trying to act like it doesn't exist, like there's no way this could possibly be. So, you know, I calmed down and we went on with our normal routines and got right back into our recording the next night. And so later that night, we recorded a whole song. And Ralph said, okay, we'll mix it in the morning. Well, woke up the next day and got ready to pull it up to mix it. The whole song was gone. It was really odd. And this happened like a couple of times. 
And so we're sitting here going, what the heck? So I would always have to go back and re-record uh, whatever parts that I was doing with the songs. And when I had to record a certain line over again or a certain verse over again, um, it would be good, but it would become greater. And I truly believe the music that we were making was just incredible. It was like just magical. Got up the next morning, Ralph had an appointment, and so he had to leave. I was in the bathroom taking a shower. And I had the door open. And all of a sudden, I was in the bathroom uh, taking a shower. And I had the door open. And all of a sudden, the door just slammed shut. I'm already on edge. And so I'm like, OK, I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to freak out. I dried myself off. I went and I checked the studio. And I opened up the door. All I saw was a silhouette of a person just moving. And it was just going back, it was going forth. And I shut the door, grabbed my phone, ran out the house, and I jumped in my car and I called Ralph and said, don't come back to the house. There's somebody in the house, there's a ghost in the house. He goes, calm down, calm down. And I said, I'm not going back to the house until you get there. And he goes, I'm, I'm on my way back to the house. We went and walked through all the rooms. And there was nothing there, nothing there. It was the freakiest thing that I'd ever experienced in my life. So about an hour later, I called Alicia in Las Vegas. And I remember telling her, there's somebody in the house. There's a ghost in the house, is what I said. And so she said, must be Andy. And I'll never forget, she started telling me the stories about her husband. Felicia was married to a guy by the name of Andy Rosoff, and he died many years ago. But Andy was like the Quincy Jones of his era. He was a genius. He wrote so many classic records. And Andy made a lot of music out of this house. Looking back at it, you could tell that this house was really special and unique because there was an energy that was in that house that only a musician could have created this atmosphere. I really honestly believe that we were being produced from the grave by Andy. I mean, we made him so many great songs in that house. And I think that without a doubt, hands down, Andy was involved. Because one thing about great musicians and people that are passionate about their music and about their art, their influence is always around some kind of way. You can't get around it. And when that one song disappeared, meant one thing and one thing only, Andy wasn't feeling it. And I think in some strange way, he was, and he is, and has been a part of who I am today. As an artist and as a musician. So before, uh, when I was younger, uh, you know, I didn't know what to think about paranormal uh, activity. I, I was really kind of skeptic, but 
After this experience in this hotel, 1993, it completely changed my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm positive that there is paranormal activity. So, uh, January 1993, I had uh, just done the Kevin Klein campaign uh, a year and a half earlier. I came out and I had a, it was my big break in modeling and started working more and more uh, pretty much every day all around the world. I was in New York, got a phone call from my agent for a big shoot in, in Los Angeles. So I, I, I flew in from New York to LA went to my hotel on Sunset Boulevard in, in, in Los Angeles, where they had booked me a nice suite. It was still kind of early in my modeling career, and I was uh, feeling good and ready to rock and roll. That evening, uh, I had some friends come over to the hotel, ordered some pizza, reminiscing about old times. I had a great time, was in a great mood. But uh, eventually, around 11.30, they went home. Shortly thereafter, I went to bed around midnight. I fell asleep pretty fast. Was in a deep sleep. Then, all of a sudden, the phone rings. I don't think I ever heard a phone ring so loud. Picked up the phone. The hello. Hello. Nobody there. Hung up the phone. Uh, so I tried to sleep again. And a few minutes later, The phone rings again, really loud. Pick up the phone. The hello. Nobody there. So I called the reception and said, I was a little pissed off, honestly. And they said, we haven't got any calls for you. Strange. Hello? A third time. Hello, and I got this eerie feeling uh, like uh, goosebumps on my skin, and, and I don't know why, but it felt like somebody was for sure on the other line, but they wouldn't say anything. Why are you doing this? I can hear you. Hung up the phone and told myself, uh, it's nothing. I really need to sleep. I need to be fresh tomorrow. So I tried to go back to sleep again. I really need to sleep. I need to be fresh tomorrow. So I try to go back to sleep again. All of a sudden, I felt almost like a cold wind. The room got so cold all of a sudden. It felt like somebody was there in the room with me. I looked around, couldn't see anything. And uh, then, the 
this woman appears. It's a thin air, I, I don't know how, but I freaked out. She was totally white, old lady. Gray long hair, wearing like drapes, almost like a cut up sheet or something. She's walking around the bed. I'm freaking out. I, 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 I'm not moving. I'm, I'm lying there. She sat down on the edge of my bed. I just lay there and waited to see what will happen next. She was kind of staring by me, not straight at me. She looked kind of sad. And uh, then all of a sudden, she's gone. It was crazy. One minute she's there, and the next minute she's completely disappeared. I was so exhausted at that point, uh, eventually I, I fell asleep. Woke up pretty early in the morning. A friend of mine, Robert, came over. We were gonna go have breakfast together. He came up to my room. I told my friend the story, what had happened uh, during the night and he couldn't believe it. Was, you know, I said, yeah, yeah, let's get out of this room. I, I, I don't want to be here anymore. And so I packed up my stuff pretty fast. So we walk out of the room, walk down the hallway, and we're kind of joking about this ghost. My friend is making fun of me, uh, you know, oh, the ghost is going to get you. All of a sudden, the light above us explodes. I mean, and poof! A, a second later, the door right in front of us just slams. It was like somebody took both hands and slammed it. And we just looked at each other. We couldn't believe what was going on. I was glad I was not a couple of feet further ahead. We would have got slammed in between the door. It was a big, thick door, too, and it could have done some damage. We were talking about this ghost, uh, making jokes about it, and all of a sudden, this happens. It seemed like this ghost, it pissed her off. Uh, almost thought, you know, I'm going crazy, like, from what happened the night before. But now, my friend was with me, there was two of us, and he, he experienced this with me as well. And after that, we hurried down to the lobby, and uh, I checked out, and I was really happy to be out of the hotel at that point. Later that day, uh, on the shoot, uh, I'm telling a couple of people about the uh, experience I had, and someone on the crew overheard me and, and, and told me they knew about the hotel and that there had been uh, uh, an old lady there. She lived there as a resident before they did a renovation, and she didn't want to move. And she was really upset and pissed off about them turning her home into a modern, new hotel. Apparently, somehow, she died uh, before they finished, and I uh, guess she maybe never moved out. I think the reason why she was there, that was a place where she used to live, and I was in her space. 
maybe she still was upset and, and wanted to disturb people that came into her home. If I would have known, I would definitely have picked another room or another hotel, but I won't go back to that room or that hotel.